So, we have a test coming up, and the last thing we talked about was uh, we were doing some hypothesis testing. True? And uh, it looks something like this. So there's no hypothesis, and there's some alternative hypothesis, so the one we were looking at last. The no hypothesis would be, well, we were interested in showing if the truth was uh, less than 25%, and, you know, the, how many people were interested in the product. Uh, so we assumed it was 25% until we could show it was lower. Uh, we took our sample results, we calculated the test statistic. Um, based on the test statistic, you know, it was beyond our critical value, so we did a rejection. Um, and anyways, that sounds vaguely familiar. Okay, so the general idea behind these is that you get a test statistic, uh, you compare it to some critical value, and if that test statistic is too far away, like if it's too extreme, then that's good evidence that the claim is probably not true, and so that's when you reject. So uh, this was a one-sided or a one-tailed or left-tailed test because the alternative was uh, less than. Uh, you treat it just slightly different with a two-sided test. So uh, this was the example we had started with. So the I think I do need this one last week sometime when we first started setting these up. There was a class that had a pass rate of 65%. At one point, changes were made. The department wants to know if pass rates has changed. So we set this up as a two-tailed test or a not equal to alternative. Um, so I think this is how we initially had the test set up. Does that sound vaguely familiar? So just see, because we were interested both ways, whether it changed, whether it's gone up or down. So we want to test a not equal to alternative. All right. So then we can actually, based on these results here, though, uh, there was 300 students, 210 passed, right? So then what's our, uh, I'll just write up here, what's our P hat here, 210 out of 300? 0 0.70. 0. Okay. So in our particular example, or in our particular sample, our sample proportion was higher than 65% question is, is that um, far enough from 65% for us to be comfortable declaring that uh, this proportion has gone up? So uh, first thing you do in a hypothesis test then, if you go back to the steps we wrote down the other day, is you do what? You got to go get a critical value. critical value because you need to establish your rejection region. Oh wait, there's one. Rejection region. Okay, so in this side, it's a not equal to alternative, um, and what's our alpha level that I wanted you to test at? 10%, right? So you pull out your Z table, if you don't have a Z that has these and Z's up here, I think we use the Z table today as well. It's down there in the bottom, right? Um, but I got extras if you want one. And then, so it looks like on a two-tailed test, see there's plus or minus values because you care if it gets too big or too small. And so there's a positive rejection region and a negative rejection region um, in a two-sided test. So then those will be our cutoffs. Our rejection region will be in the tails on either side. And if our test statistic goes past that on the top or past that on the bottom, then we'll reject. Okay. Now, after you have your critical value and your rejection region, then you need to actually go get your test statistic that you're going to use to make your decision. And it's that z-score, and it's this uh, kind of messy one. It's the z-score we use from the central limit theorem for proportions. Uh, and we're going to use the claim proportion inside the formula because we're always working under the assumption that the claim is true. It's okay, if the truth are really 65%. So in this case, we'll take our uh, test or our sample proportion, which was 70%, and then 65% goes everywhere else. And I think it was what, 300 people? 300, but so you get a test statistic. And actually, uh, we did get this one to, in my, to this one in my other class. Uh, you should be able to calculate, calculate that out and get a test statistic. Uh, 1.82 if you round it to two decimal places, which we would with these questions. So.
So, what do you think? Anybody else able to get that? At least one person. They're kind. I mean, they're kind of hard to enter in your calculator. You have to keep track of them separately, or you have to be really careful about your parentheses. Got to make sure your numerator is in parentheses. One point. So we're around to two decimal places because it's a z score. But okay. So now we've got our test statistic. We know the rejection region. So what should be our decision? Where is that in the rejection region or not? One point eight two. Is it? So where is it though? Is where is one point eight two? It's above the cutoff. So 1.82 is up here. So is it in our rejection region? It is. Yeah, it actually is, right? Because it's out in the tails beyond the cutoff we had set. Remember, so we're rejecting when things get too far away from what they're claiming. So we're always rejecting when our things get out into the tails. The tails are where you're not likely to see things. So when our test statistics start getting way out in the tails, that's telling us that the null hypothesis is not very likely because we're seeing something that's very unlikely. Um, okay. So then our decision, so we should, well, in this case, the test statistic is in the rejection region. So then we should probably, what? Reject. Okay. It's evidence for the alternative, yeah, for the change. Yeah. So then what are we really saying here? We're saying that it looks have our pass rates the same or have they changed? What are we ultimately saying? It's saying that it looks like they changed. Okay, so I have it's in my, I have the interpretation here, but this would be your interpretation. Right? So there is evidence to suggest the truth is no longer sixty five percent. That would be a very uh, judicious sort of interpretation of it, very technically correct. Um, but really, what are you really saying? You're saying looks like half rate percent. Okay. So. What do you think? So it's critical value. That gives you your rejection region. Then you go get your statistic, and that's how you make a choice. All right. Any questions about uh, this example, where any of these numbers came from, how we made any of our choices here? All right, um, there is a, uh, so like you can look at this example and uh, even if you didn't get a critical value here, we could look at this test statistic and kind of see that that test statistic is pretty far away from, uh, you know, pretty far away from the mean, pretty far away from what we would expect to see. So you can actually do a hypothesis test without actually having to get the uh, critical values. And there's something called a p-value approach to hypothesis testing. And um, I think I want to just, well, actually, that's a two-sided example. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to do a p-value approach, and then I'll explain it. But uh, we already did, we don't need to, like, reconstruct an entire example. Uh, so we already did this one with the coffee, right? And the null hypothesis was uh, that the mean was equal, or I'm sorry, we're in proportions, it was 25 versus the alternative that it was less than, right? And um, we went and we got a test statistic, right? The test statistic was that z-score. And if you go back to what we did last week, what was our test statistic for this um, test? Go, I can go. Negative. Well, that was the sample proportion. See, this is what we did last week. 
The sample proportion was 14% on one of the muffins, but our test statistic was negative 2.54, right, after we calculated the z-score. Yeah? So, if you go back to that, so our test statistic was, whoa, oh man, it's not going to like me now. It's going to want to keep that stuff. I don't actually know. There we go. It's coming back. Maybe. So our p hat was 0 0.14. And so we plugged that into the test statistic formula and got a negative 2.54. Yeah. <coughs> okay, now what happens is you say, all right, they're claiming it was 25%. I saw a sample with only 14%. That's like 2.54 standard deviations below what I would expect to see if they were telling the truth. So then what we can actually kind of quantify that you know how how far away is this thing because we could take our test statistic to the z table and we could look it up on the z table right and we could figure out you know what's the probability of being out here near our test statistics so then you pull out your z table because our test statistics is z score and you say okay you go to negative 2.54 and what's the probability right there? Zero point zero zero five five. Okay. So this right here, this is what's referred to as a p value of the test. The p value, it's like the tail probability. beyond uh, your test statistic. So you can do the test in a p-value approach. You just go straight to calculating your test statistic. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that test statistic and table, and the table is going to tell you the tail, the tail probability beyond what you saw. Now the reason that you measure that is essentially what this is saying is this is like this is saying that the probability of seeing like our result, you know, or worse, if H not were true is zero point zero zero five. That's what it's saying. It's a conditional probability. It's the probability of seeing stuff down here given that the null hypothesis are true. Now, what this is saying is it's saying we saw something down at 14%. Well, that would only happen. You'd only see something, you'd only see things that low or lower, like less than 1% of the time, if the null hypothesis were true. So, does it seem like the null hypothesis is probably true then? No, because we're saying, what it's saying is it's saying that what I saw is very unlikely given that the null hypothesis is true. And because it's so unlikely under the null hypothesis, uh, I'm willing to actually reject the claim. And so the way you use that p-value is that if that p-value gets really low, you reject. Um, you can almost think of the p-value, it's almost, and I'm saying approximately because this is not exactly how you can't exactly interpret it this way but it can be thought of that way it's almost like the probability of the claim being true you can kind of think of it that way so what it's saying is that the probability that the claim is true is actually quite low there's a very low chance of the null hypothesis being true and the way you ultimately make your decision then is you compare your p-value to your alpha level and you say okay i was willing to make a type 1 error 1% of the time, this p-value is essentially telling me how likely I am to be making a type 1 error. It's saying like, you can reject the null hypothesis right now, and there's only a 0 .0055 chance you're making a type 1 error. So uh, it's actually below, it's less than what I was willing to accept.
And so the way you make your decision is you compare, and if your p-value, if your p-value dips below your alpha level, then you should reject the no hypothesis. Okay, I'm gonna put down a list to like outline all these steps in a second, and then we'll do another example. And this gives you a really nice sort of uh, indicator of how strong your evidence is. The p-value is a way to quantify how strong the evidence is. So the lower that p-value is, the lower that p-value is, then the less likely the null hypothesis is. I mean, we made, that's the same mistake, or that's the same decision we had already made when we did it with the critical value approach. So the p-value approach and the critical value approach, won't, they won't result in conflicting decisions. They'll always lead you to make the same decision in the hypothesis test. Yeah. All right, so uh, basically the main step, so in a p-value approach, you don't actually need a critical value. You're going to go straight to your test statistic. Right, same exact test statistic that we use for the critical value approach. Then you're going to go get your p-value because your p-value is going to be the tail probability um, beyond the test statistic. Okay. The p-value is going to come from the table. Okay. So now this is something you have to be you have to be careful about this because um, it depends. Like your critical value, it depends on your alternative. Because if your alternative was less than, then you're going to get a negative test statistic, and your p-value is going to be the lower tail. If your alternative is greater than, you're going to get a, probably a positive test statistic, and your tail would be the top tail, right? So it's just the tail probability. It's not always less than or always greater than. It's like just the area of the tail beyond your statistic. And then the two-sided approach is even a little more weird, because in the two-sided approach, you'll get a test statistic, you know, and you'll get a p-value maybe above it. Sorry. Oh, dang it. I'm going backwards. But you also have to remember that you were originally testing both sides. And so then uh, it's kind of weird you actually end up having to double the p-value. Just like you had to have the alpha, you had to have the alpha level, but you doubled the p-value. Then the way you make your decision is you compare it and if your p-value is less than your alpha level then you reject and uh, if it's not if your p-value exceeds your alpha level then uh, you fail to reject yeah I got one coming up right now can you were you were you saying why or were you saying do it? Well, I do one. Uh, if you could, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Definitely. All right. What do you think? So it's essentially the process we just did in the last example. Um, but you can start from there. You don't have to do the critical value approach at all. The value comes from the z table. Comes from the z table in this case because we have z. Our test statistic is a z score. Okay, because proportions are all on the z table. We will have to pull out the t table for means, but okay. So when you're testing it, you have two choices. Right, if you go back to the um, the muffin example originally, you could, so like this was a one-sided test, 
So you could just go get your critical value and your rejection region off of the table. And then you can calculate your test statistics to see if it goes into the rejection region and then you're, make your decision that way. That's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is you can skip the, um, the critical value step altogether. You can go straight to your test statistic. Then you'll take that test statistic to the Z table, and then the Z table will give you the p-value. Then once you have a p-value, you can, can, you can compare it to your alpha level. Those are your two options. All right. Okay. Uh, does now, the two side is the weird one, though, uh, because like in our last example, you have, to, you have two rejection reasons, like because you care both ways. Okay. So I want to revisit this one and do it as a, a p-value approach. All right. So the null hypothesis, this is what we just did at the beginning, is that the truth is 65%. The alternative hypothesis is that the truth is no longer 65%, right? Wait a second. Something's wrong. Oh, nothing's wrong. Okay. That, nothing's wrong. Okay. I thought something else was wrong. Okay. So, uh, we already know what the choice is here, right? What decision do we end up making? Yeah, we rejected the no hypothesis. We decided that pass rates have changed. Yeah. So, I wanted to see, though, if you could, how this would have been done if we would have chosen not to go critical value approach. So our sample proportion was 70%, right? Okay. So in the critical value approach, uh, sorry, not the critical, in the p-value approach, we don't even care about the critical value. We're going to go straight to the test statistic, right? Which, which is that p hat minus the p0 all over this whole thing. Yeah, it was 1.82. Is our critical value, right? Sorry, keep saying that word. I'm going to test this. Thing. All right. Now, from that, we're going to take that value and we're going to calculate a p value. And you got to remember that the p value is always in the tail. So if 1.82 is positive, then the p value is going to come from the top tail above it. So if you look up 1.82 in your table, in your Z table, what do you got there? 9656, right? But that's the area below. So then our P value would be one minus, right, 0 0.9656, which is 0 0.0344, okay? Now, this would be the P value if this were a one-sided test, okay, that would be the p-value. But we actually wanted to reject in either direction. And so since the alternative is not equal to, then we need to double our p-value and consider that we were willing to accept both ways. And so actually uh, our p-value would become two times that which would be what, 0 0.0688? So that would be our p-value. But what decision is it going to lead us to do? Man, what do I, I don't know what I keep pressing to make myself go all the way back to the beginning, but whatever. So what does that end up telling us to do? Yeah, either way, it's going to lead us to the same decision because then what do we do with that p-value, 0688, what do we compare it to? We compare it to our alpha level, right? And maybe, yeah, there we go. So then what we do is we compare and we say, well, how did our p-value, 0.0688, how did that compare to the alpha level we had set going into this, 10%, the p-value is less than your alpha level, and so then your decision should be the same as we had made earlier, 
it should be to reject the null hypothesis. You should reject because your p-value is low. It's the easier way, and it's actually really the more, it's the more informative way to do it. And the reason why, well, I'll show you in a second this why. But any questions on this one, like how to find a p-value? The doubling it is just the rule for a two-sided alternative. So if you can just accept the rule, that's the rule. Um, you wouldn't double it if it were a one-sided alternative. So it's showing like the other side of the yeah. line under 0.1. Exactly. It's like, okay. it's, it's saying that we, that's our p-value in that direction, but we were willing to reject in both directions. So it's like, yeah, okay. you double your p-value for both of us. All right. Any other questions on that one? Is the reason why we're doing the doubling is because of the wording of, is it change? Yeah. Yeah. Because, because not yeah. Completely. Exactly. Because okay. we care, because we care both ways. Anything else? Okay, so the p-value is actually used more often in um, research. Normally, the way you'll a lot of times what you'll see in conclusions is you would see something like um, there is evidence that rate, like in this case, it was pass rates, right? So you would say there is evidence that pass rates have changed. And then what you'll see is you'll see that p-value reported in the statement. So not only will you be able to tell people what your decision was, but then you'll be able to give them a number to sort of quantify how certain you are in your decision making. Because like, if we would have sampled 100 people and nobody wanted muffins, that's way stronger evidence. Right, but it would have produced a super, super small p value. Ours was 14% out of 100. That's less than 0.5%, but you know, wait, this is the pass rate example. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, I, I really shouldn't be doing two examples. We've got two examples in my head, and I don't know why. This is a pass rate, right? So if we would have taken a sample in like, say, 100 out of, you know, like 300, like 33% of pass, that'd be strong evidence that our pass rate has changed. Ours was 70%. That's only a little bit away from kind of the claim. So there's evidence that it's changed, but it's not as strong because we're not that far away from the claim of 65%. So typically speaking, you can kind of use those p-values because if you have, uh, so the general rule is like if you have p-values that are, uh, say, if your p-values exclude exceed 10%, then at that point you really don't have any evidence <coughs> for your alternative. Okay. Um, if you see p-values, if you see p-values that are between like 10% uh, and 5%, that's in that range where you start to say, okay, it's starting to look like perhaps there's some evidence to support the alternative. So p-values in the 5 to 10% range. If you see p-values that are somewhere in between like 1% and 5%, then that's considered a uh, pretty strong evidence for the alternative. And then if you see p-values that dip below um, 1%, then that's really, really strong evidence. That's very strong evidence for the alternative. So it gives you kind of a spectrum that you can use to determine, you know, how confident or how how good do you feel about the decision you made. You know? So our decision with our pass rates of p-value is 0.06, 0.07. That's there's some evidence that the rates have changed, but it's not super super convincing. So it's like there's there's some evidence there, but but maybe we would want to take bigger samples or something to see. But there's some evidence uh, if our p-value gets pushed into lower values, though, like the muffin example, have a really really small p-value. Right? The p-value in the muffin example is like 0 0.0055. So it was less than one percent. That's really really strong evidence. People probably don't want to know. Probably be pretty confident in making that choice. Okay. So normally this is what you'll see. 
if you read a research paper, and then you can know that when they make a claim and then they report a p-value, they're trying to help you understand how strong their decision was. That's what they're trying to help you understand. And high p-values are very slim evidence. Low p-values are very strong evidence. Okay. All right. Cool. So two, two, two results. So honestly, most people don't do a critical value approach. Most people do a p-value approach because they're going to report the p-value anyways. Um, but the critical value approach is important, um, especially when we start testing means, if you have to do it using a table. Because it's harder to get the p-value out of a t-table than it is a t-table. Okay. Any questions? Because we're going to do some tests about means, or at least get talking about them. All right? Cool. So, turns out we don't really have to learn any new procedures. All we have to do is update our test statistic. Okay. So, if you think about what we've been doing, so for proportions, our test statistic was a z-score, right? Z-score, p-hat minus p-zero, all over, you know, all this stuff. <coughs> Yeah, our test statistic was a z-score. Uh, our p-value and our critical value come from where? They come from, yeah, from the uh, z-score and the z-table. The critical value doesn't have to do with your test statistic, right? But okay. And then, so you have a test statistic, and then you're going to go get a p-value, your critical value off the z-table, and then you make your decision based on those some combination of those values. Either your test statistic gives you your p-value, that makes helps you make your choice, or the test statistic gets compared to the critical value, that helps you make your choice. Turns out, we can do pretty much the exact same process for tests about means, except for, from what we learned about confidence intervals, what do you think we're gonna have to do when we start dealing with means? The, yeah, the confidence interval formula for means was the only time we ever had to pull out the t-table, right? So the means, anything, anytime, most of the time when you're dealing with means, you basically have to be on the t-table. So our test statistic, we're still going to use a test statistic. It's just not going to be a z-score. It's going to be a t-score. And if you remember, I said that the t-distribution pops up when you construct a z-score, but rather than have the population standard deviation, you're stuck using the sample standard deviation. It was this thing right here that turns it into a t-distribution. Was it estimating the standard deviation with the sample standard deviation? Okay. But calculating that z-score, it's just like back in module 7, where we did the x bar minus b over sigma over root n, just because we were averaging multiple observations. Okay. So our test statistic is going to be a t-statistic, so then where do you think we should go to get our p-value and our critical value? Yeah. Okay. So for proportions, everything came off the z-table. For means now, we're just going to switch over and do the same process on the t-table. It's a little bit harder, though, because... T distributions have degrees of freedom. And so it makes things a little more complicated. And the T table reads, you have to read the T table a little differently than you read the Z table. But you can do it. I'm confident. All right, I'm gonna show you how. It's really, it's really not that crazy. All right, so here's the deal. Now with means, the critical value is actually easier. The critical value approach is easier. We'll see why in a second. So let's think of one. And we were actually, this is a, uh, a, present, a problem I presented to you when we first started formulating hypothesis tests. Um, in 2017, there was a previous average price per square foot. You are going to take 50 sales in the area, and you want to test whether or not the prices have gone up. And so as a hypothesis test, we frame this as, remember, we're all in means now, right? Average 
okay, means we think, well, the, we'll claim or we'll assume that they're the same until we can prove that they've gone up. Yeah, that's how we frame this one. It used to be 94, 35. We think they've gone up, but until we can prove they've gone up, we'll assume they're the same and then see if we can show that they're the same. Okay, so this was our initial test. Now this particular example now, uh, this is assuming, okay, so suppose you went out and you got those 50 values and your sample mean was 96.74 with a standard deviation of 640. Like these are at actual outputs. So I'm not gonna make you actually calculate the mean of the standard deviation, but you could do it if you had to. If I gave you 50 home values, you could go get that number and that number and calculate means of the standard deviation. Now the question is, uh, is that enough evidence at the 0.05 level to say that the prices have actually gone up? What's that? Yeah, so what we have to do here is, um, now you can, you can get a critical value off the t-table in a rejection region. Okay. All you have to do is remember that with a the t-table there's degrees of freedom and then you have an alpha level. That's basically what you need through the t-table. So if this was our example, then what's our, uh, if you actually went out and your sample size was 50, what would be our degrees of freedom? 49 degrees of freedom. Now, this is one of those where the table doesn't read that finely. And so you want to round to the closest one your table does read. So this experiment would have 49 degrees of freedom. What's our alpha level? 0 0.05, right? Now, this is where it's a little different than the confidence intervals, because confidence intervals were both ways, up and down, plus or minus. So we cut that alpha level in half. But on a one-sided alternative, we don't do that. On a one-sided alternative, you load up all your alpha on one side. So this is going to be the column we're going to go down, and this is going to be the row that we're going to intersect it with. So 50 degrees of freedom, and you're going to go down the 0.05 column on your t-table. So if you do that, pull out your t-table, I got more up here if you need them. There's a 0.05 column intersected with 50 degrees of freedom. What's that value? 1.676. Okay. So our critical value is 1.676. And then everything above that becomes our rejection region. Yeah. Yeah, always. But in this case, we have to round it for our table, so it just goes back up. We're just going to use this row. So the nice thing was that the Z table just gave you that cutoff, right? You just go there, it's like, oh, 5%, right tail, 1.645. Um, with the T table, we don't have that luxury. We have to go get it every time. Um, but it's not too hard. You just, okay, your degrees of freedom are just based on your sample size, and your alpha level is already given to you. So that tells you what column to go down. Um, so and if it were a less than alternative, you'd do the same process, but we would just use the negative value and a low rejection region. So if, if this would have been a less than alternative, our cutoff would have been negative 1.676. We would have got it the exact same way, and then our rejection region would have been negative. Yeah. So if it was like 45, would you still around? Yeah, if it was 45, you'd still around 50. If it was 44, you'd have down 40. Just like the standard round. Okay. All right. Other questions about where that number came from? Or why I picked it? Okay. So then that's the critical value. So we can go get our test statistic. So since this is a test about means, our test statistic is going to be a T statistic. And it's going to be our sample mean minus the claim, because remember we're working under the assumption 
that the null hypothesis is true divided by the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay. What do you get for that statistic? Any takers on the number there? Two point six four one. Anybody else? I could try it myself, but two point six four one. Two point six four one. Two times. I like that. I'm going with it. Okay, perfect. 2.641. And uh, you can round it to two decimal places. T, t values, and if you look at your table, are usually three places. So, uh, But it actually doesn't really matter because we're comparing it, right? We're making the comparison to the rejection region, the cutoff, right? And if you look at where that test statistic falls, where is it? Yeah, it's above the uh, rejection, it's above the critical value, it's above the rejection region. That's a big test statistic anyways, right? We know that as soon as you start getting these scores up, in this case, these scores up above like two, you know, that's almost three standard deviations above what you expect to see, so that's getting pretty far. Uh, so it's probably gonna get rejected, right? So then in our decision, well then we can make this without a p-value. You don't have to have a p-value. So your test statistic is in the rejection region, so then you should probably reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, what are you actually saying here? If you reject the null hypothesis, are you saying that the price has gone up or the price has stayed the same? You're saying the price has gone up. Because the claim is that they stayed the same, the alternatives that they've gone up. So then you say that there is evidence that the uh, mean price per square put has gone up. Now, this case, the critical value approach on pets about mean, because it involves a t-table, is a little more straightforward. But you can, you can approximate a p-value here. But before I do that, do you guys have any questions about that example? Yeah. I'm just confused when you do a p-value and when you don't really need to do a p-value. You never need to do a p-value. Okay. Unless I specifically ask you what the p-value is, but there's no you don't have you don't have you can do one or the other. You don't have to do both approaches. So are p-values just more exact? That's why right. P for yes, and p-values are more interpretable because I can just tell you like I could tell you like oh that guy was convicted of a crime, okay, and that can just be I can he, we convicted him of the crime. That could be one thing, right? But uh, that's like or I could tell you we convicted him of the crime. Uh, but there was, you know, we didn't like, there was a couple things here or there that were a little weird. Or I could say, we convicted him of the crime because they had him on video and then five phone calls were recorded of him telling everybody he did it, right? Like, that's, there's a difference between those two outcomes, right? And so that's what the p-value gives you. It gives you more context about how convinced you were to make your choice. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, there's one. In the, there's a couple of these on the. Uh, there's one like this on the practice test too. Well, you need to put that quote in the practice test. I actually just did. Oh. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, now, so p-value is not required to make the right choice. 
But if you wanted to get one, the thing with the, the tea table is because the tea table is not as, uh, it doesn't contain quite as much information uh, as the Z table. And so we can approximate the P value uh, and you just have to do this when you're, the, reason, the only reason you ever have to do this process is when you're testing means. Okay. The way you do it is you, you have, so you take your test statistic that we calculated in the last one. So it was that 2.641. Okay. Then you take your degrees of freedom, which were 49, and we're going to have to round them to 50. Here's the way you do it. You go to the 50 degrees of freedom table, or 50 degrees of freedom row on the table, and then you start looking across that row until you find the two values that bound your test statistic. So if you're looking on your t-table, and for some reason I now have two z's. If you pull out your t-table, go across the 50 degree of freedom row, and then eventually you'll run into 2. yeah, 2.403, and then 2.678. See those? The reason I picked those values is because our test statistic, 2.641, is between these values, right? That was our test statistic. So our test statistic with bad degrees of freedom is in between these two cutoffs, right? Well then, what you do is you just go from those columns and you just back yourself up to the top. And if you read those all the way to the top, this is the 0 0.01 column. And this is the 0 0.005 column. So the way the t-table reads is the t-table gives you the tail probability on the top and then inside you is your test statistic. It only like reads backwards from the z-table. So then this is telling us that our p-value is bounded by those two values. So then our p-value is in between those two numbers. Okay. So because our test statistic is in between these two t-scores, then our p-value has to be in between those two tail probabilities. But that's a really, really low p-value, right? So you would still make the decision, right? You'd say, you know, the evidence suggests that uh, prices have gone up. Because that was the example we were using. And then you don't know exactly what the p-value is but you know it's less than 1%, which is very strong evidence um, against the... On the, the, the team, um, that one is 0.10. That one is 0.01. Yeah. There is a 0 0.1 column that's further over. questions about that one so there's there's two ways to do it you know you can just you can always just fall back on the critical value approach where it's just like okay I'm gonna get my cutoff I'm gonna get my test statistic and that's how I'm gonna make my choice so it's just that when you're doing test about means you have to remember to use the t-table so you're gonna have to deal with degrees of freedom you have to deal with the alpha level, but it's not that bad. It's just basically you go down the alpha level column and you're expected with degrees of freedom. That gets you cut off. And then you can compare your test statistic. But you could still do the p value approach. You just get your test statistic. Don't worry about a critical value. Go into the table on your degrees of freedom row. Figure out, okay, where is my test statistic on that row? And then that'll tell you where your p-value is, you know, between one value or another. And so even though you don't know exactly what your p-value is, you can still make a decision because all of those cutoffs on the t-table, these, all of these correspond with like 
uh, alpha levels, right? So you'll, it'll never be ambiguous as to whether or not you should reject because you'll always know whether your alpha level is like less than 10% or less than 5% or less than 1% because there's cutoffs on the table for that. So you could take that approach if, if you want. Either one is either one is fine. If you look on the price test though, usually I'll ask for usually I'll ask for the p I usually like to see if you can get a p value. So I'll usually ask for a p value, but you can still make the correct choice on the test and get pretty much almost full points on an example if you didn't know how to get a p value technically. Are useful. These guys are useful. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I think I'll stop there. We'll do another example tomorrow, and then I might have even more examples than that to bring in. Um, but the practice test is out, and the solutions to the practice test are also posted now.